Hello, welcome to Meet Your Neighbor. This is our very first program uh, that we are meeting on Zoom to talk with our guest for today, which is Bob Foster of Hopkinton. And we are doing this through Zoom at HCAM TV, and we're Zooming over to the other side of town to talk to Bob about his life, uh, the, all the history he has seen, what he's gotten through, his optimistic perspective, uh, his uh, traveling to Greece, uh, even when we're confined in our homes through Zoom, and giving lectures in his retirement years, and he's an author. So let's hear more of what Bob has to say. Hello, Cheryl. <laughs> Welcome, and thank you for saying yes to the very first Zoom Meet Your Neighbor interview. It's nice to be here, and I'm looking forward to it myself. Yes, um, I uh, am familiar with you from the recent contributions in the Hope Through Community anthology that I was a part of and you were a part of and you had submitted some haiku poems uh, then and I read your bio and I thought oh you know I would love to do an interview and have Hopkinton get to know more about you and in um, collecting a little information in advance um, and thinking about talking together things we'd like to talk about I guess it was first first we're in this time of pandemic, global pandemic, right? So I want to ask you first, how are you doing there at your home? What have you been up to uh, in these times since we can't meet face to face? Uh, yes, it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> I've uh, sheltered in place like everybody else. And I'm being very careful. I live alone. I have, however, I have a son who lives uh, within walking distance of my home. so. You know, anything that I need uh, that I can't go out and get, he can do. So I'm pretty comfortable. Um, I've got everything I need and uh, food when I need it. And of course, uh, the, the, the worst for me, like everybody, is just losing contact with friends and not being able to, uh, to see people and go out to dinner and all those wonderful things that we do. But I, I, we, you know, my generation, those of us who are retired and we don't have little kids around the house to worry about, we're pretty fortunate. And I keep uh, telling my peers, as much as we complain about it, we're pretty fortunate. Uh, we're safe, we're warm, we're, <laughs> we're well fed, and we don't have uh, a lot of heavy responsibilities with uh, young children. I, I really, I feel for those young parents who have children at home. That's got to be uh, very, very difficult. And I remind myself of that when I, when I become impatient. Uh, but but I, for, from my point of view, I'm doing fine. Oh, good to hear. And I agree with you about how difficult it must be to be parents and children in these days. Yeah. Um, now, what I wanted to start and ask you about is understanding that you are a, a Great Depression baby, I believe, as you put it, and you grew up in World War II, and you were uh, in the presence and awareness of the atomic bomb, as you had made reference to, and the Cold War and the Korean and Vietnam War. You've been, you've seen a lot of life, and and now we are facing this time, which seems like no other, of the global pandemic and more. There has just been so much going on. And yet, I uh, one thing I know about you is you identify as an optimist. And I'm curious about what that means, how you are an optimist. Uh, it's so important to hear, I think, more about an optimist perspective in these times. Yes, well, it's interesting. I, I have two grandsons. And they are, uh, you know, in their early 20s. And of course, they see all the problems in the world, and they're not sure that these problems we can deal with. And uh, my generation is going to go pass on, and they're going to be left with all these problems, and it's just, just awful. And it strikes me that anybody who's 20 to 25 has never lived through what I consider to be a world crisis. They were too young to uh, experience 9-11. They heard about it and everything else. And yeah, they knew about some of the wars, that, uh, but they haven't affected us. Nobody in, in my family has gone off to war. 
and uh, my grandsons just see these terrible problems. So I remind them, I say, look, I was born in 1932. I grew up during the depression. During the 1930s, what my parents talked about most of the time was, you know, the economy and their jobs. And of course they were beginning to worry about Europe and they talked all about that a lot. But during the uh, depression, uh, that, was, that was what hung over everybody's head. And then of course, along came World War II and we lived through that. Uh, and that just, it, it encapsulated everything that had to do with life. We, we finished the war and things looked pretty good. Uh, we had developed a weapon that made us the supreme power in the whole world. We thought that, oh, okay, fine, everything's fine now. There's never gonna be any wars because we've got the weapon that can stop everything. Suddenly, three or four years after the end of World War II, the Soviets also had that weapon. And you know, suddenly it became dangerous. And I remember in high school, when I was a junior and senior in high school back in the late 40s, we were pretty uh, pessimistic about it. We, we couldn't see how the world was going to survive with two major powers with this terrible weapon. Uh, so we went through the Cold War. And then we went through a couple of wars, Korean War and some of my high school uh, friends actually ended up in the Korean War, one of them died. Then there was the uh, war in Vietnam. All of these world events was one right after the other. In my generation, we experienced all that. And so when I talk to my grandsons, I say, look, <laughs> you know, this, this world has uh, survived some pretty uh, difficult and dangerous and, and frightening times. And we got through it. And this country got through it. And this country now is going through some very difficult times too. And we were I was talking to my sons back when we had a president who, um, well, let's not talk about that. But anyway, it was depressing for them too. And I said, look, we get through this too. That's why I guess maybe why I'm a, an optimist. Uh, uh, and, and then this, this, this current uh, pandemic, uh, you know, I, I, I talk a little bit about that if it's okay, Cheryl. Sure. My mother, was an RN. She was a registered nurse. She graduated. <laughs> she graduated from nurses training in 1918. Wow. Right. Yeah. Right at the height of the Spanish flu. And for the rest of her life, she never forgot what it was like. She talked about it. Uh, and I remember if, even from my youngest years, hearing her talk about how terrible that was. Well, in the Spanish flu, 30 million people around the world died in the Spanish flu. And that went from 1918 to about 1919. Um, it, she said, you, you can't imagine how bad it was. And now I look at what we're going through now. They lost, there were 30 million people that died in the Spanish flu around the world. We've lost 400,000 already right here in this country. It, 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 it's, it's amazing. And of course, as my mother pointed out in those days, we had no uh, medication for the Spanish flu, basically, certainly no vaccines. The Spanish flu just kind of ran its course. And we, today, we have vaccines coming out, at least two that have been improved in this country and uh, several more that are on the, you know, in the labs still. And we do have some uh, treatments for those who are sick. Even though it's a pandemic it's around the world, we have an answer to it. They didn't have that answer in 1918. So again, I say to my sons, look, we're living in a different era. It's, we have a science that is advanced that in 1918, they couldn't even imagine. We have a vaccine that was not uh, close to being available at that time. So there are reasons for us to be optimistic. Yes, a lot of people are dying, uh, but there's really, uh, if people will just pay attention to what they're being told to do, your generation, especially I say to my grandsons, your generation will be fine. So, you know, we talk about optimism, I guess maybe that's where I get mine. So you get yours back from the history you've been through and you, would you say your mother also, all she's been through, uh, going through yeah. those times, yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, she was, you know, well, you know, she, she died um, almost 30 years ago. And so, she, you know, but, but
but she never, never uh, forgot that experience that she had. And apparently what they did when, when she graduated, there was such a need for nursing that she spent some years. Now this, she was, she was born in Jericho, Vermont, way up in Northern Vermont. I, I grew up in Burlington, Vermont, but she grew up in, on a farm. She had seven brothers and two sisters and her father had a dairy farm. She was, she went to uh, nurses training and uh, graduated, I think she was about 20 when she graduated in 1918. Apparently they shipped some of these brand new nurses off to other parts of the country because she spent some time in uh, Philadelphia and uh, she was almost bitter about her experiences in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Coming from the small town of Northern Vermont, going into the big city in the middle of a pandemic, that, that was just part of her terrible experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can see how uh, she had likely a big influence on you, and you are having one on your sons and grandsons as well for the future generation. I, I think um, that's the way it's supposed to be, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's pretty valuable, uh, especially at these times, um, to hear these messages. So, so thank you for um, keeping optimism alive. Okay, good, sure. <laughs> times. Um, let's see. So, uh, you grew up in Vermont. Yes. In Burlington, Vermont, and um, did you grow up on a farm also? No, Burlington was the major city in Vermont when I was growing up. There was about a population of about 30,000. Yeah. Burlington, Rutland, and Montpelier were the two major cities in, in Vermont. Mm -hmm. I grew up right in the city in okay. Burlington. And uh, I, I, you know, I knew about farm life because we visited there. But uh, no, I was, I was a city kid. So you were a city kid. And then eventually you made your way to Hopkinton, where we are now. What brought you here? I attended the University of Vermont. After I graduated from high school, I went to the University of Vermont, found my way into civil engineering. I thought, you know, when I was in high school, I thought I wanted to be an architect. That became impractical. Uh, and so I, you know, I wasn't terribly bright about all those things. To me, civil engineering and architecture are pretty much the same thing. So I, I, I took up civil engineering at the University of Vermont. Uh, I finally uh, graduated from that in 55. However, I was, I got married to a woman from Dedham, Massachusetts in 1954. So during my last year, we were married and I knew that we were going into the military because I had gone through ROTC and I had elected to stay in ROTC because the, the draft was still in effect in those days. I didn't want to be drafted out of school. So we, I knew we had a three year commitment and my wife and I said, gee, if we wait until the end of our three years in the military, I'm going to be 27, 28 years old. Life was half over, we thought, in those days. So we said, let's start our family before we go in the military. So we did. And uh, our, our oldest son was born in November 1955. Mm -hmm. uh, two months later, we left for Texas in oh, January 1956. <laughs> in a 1953 Ford that I bought, we took off my wife and I and a two-month-old child. And uh, we spent three years in the military. I went through pilot training and various other things. I ended up in a, a strategic air command base in Topeka, Kansas. Along the way, we had two more children. Wow. And <laughs> when we got out of the military in uh, January 1959, we drove back from Topeka, Kansas to uh, Dedham, Massachusetts, now with a three-year-old son, a one-year-old son, and a two-month-old son. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and, and, you know, to us, that was natural because that's what our generation did. We, right. we couldn't wait to get back from all of these distractions like the military to start our careers. And we were seeing people coming out of the Korean War. And many people that I went to college with were veterans from the Korean War. And we saw them jumping in, starting their careers, getting their education, doing their careers. And, and we just felt we, we couldn't play around. We had to get started. You had to get married. You had to have children. You had to go through the military and come back and find a career. And that, that was, those were the pressures. That's a lot of pressures. <laughs> well, we thought so. Yes. <laughs> and now you, I talk to my young, my, my, not only my grandsons, but my sons, I tell them about that. And they say, 
you guys must have been crazy. <laughs> like having babies at the age of 24, you must have been crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, I, maybe we were. <laughs> and so then you uh, eventually arrived to Hopkinton? Yes, we came back. My, as I said, my wife was uh, from Denham. Right. And, and I had assumed that we'd end up back in, in Vermont and I'd have a career there, but there were no jobs in Vermont at that time in 1959. And we were staying with my wife's uh, mother in Dedham, Margaret Fisher. There may still be some people in Hopkins who remember her. She was a wonderful woman, but we stayed with her and I started looking for jobs in Massachusetts. And I found one fairly quickly right in Framingham, an engineering company. And we took that job, or I took that job and I was commuting back and forth between Dedham and Framingham every day. And in the meantime, my wife went out looking for housing and we intended to buy a house. We, uh, we saved enough money in the military to make a down payment on a house. So she went looking for a house and I went to work every day. And one day I came home and she said, okay, I think I found it. Oh, you have a house. <laughs> where? And she said, well, it's in Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. I said, where? She said, Hopkinton. I said, what is Hopkinton? I had no idea about Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. Between Dedham and Framingham, uh, you didn't come close to Hopkinton. So she said, oh no, it's a nice little town very close to Framingham, and she took me and showed me the house. And a, a local realtor, Mary McDonough, at that time was the major realtor in Hopkinton. And she showed us a house that was a 100 year old house, like many of the, the old mill houses in Hopkinton. And there are many of them there in today and as there were then. And we bought the house and moved in and uh, been in Hopkinton ever since. I've uh, I built two houses after that. I'm now on my second, uh, my third Hopkinton house, the second one we built. But uh, that's how we got to Hopkinton and we, uh, and, and we loved it. It's, it's a wonderful town. And the changes that, uh, that I've seen since 1959 are truly remarkable. And a lot of people think not necessarily for the better. I, I think that it's just a great town. And everything is, uh, it, it's a nice place to live and the school system is absolutely super. Mm, well, that's uh, wonderful to hear and inspiring. And I'm glad you have moved here and you, and you uh, continue on here. Uh, so you worked as an engineer and you are now in your retirement years? That's correct, yes. Uh, and yet incredibly busy from what I understand when I have uh, connected with you to do this interview. You had many days scheduled. You were talking over at Greece the other day uh, to Greece uh, in a lecture. Uh, what what are you involved with? What is this? Uh... Well, it's it's very interesting. I, I got involved in an international federation. Uh, it's the International Federation of Surveyors, actually, and FIG, Federation Internationale Geometre. Ah. <laughs> and I was president for uh, three or four years and uh, became quite involved in that organization. And it's a federation of national associations of cartographers, geographers, surveyors, and engineers with about, uh, I think now it's like 110 or 120 national associations members. And, you know, I did a lot of traveling. Um, we, we talk about you know, what do you like to do? I like to travel. Well, I, I visited at least 30 countries while I was oh my goodness, in wow. leadership of FIG. And oh I met a lot of nice people. And I met people in Greece, uh, made good friends in Greece. And especially a couple, married couple, two professors at the National Technical University of Athens. Mm -hmm. And we corresponded for years and they have a beach house and they invited me to their beach house right on the Aegean and of course, I've been doing that ever since every summer for, well, 15, almost 20 years. But they're, they're academics. And, uh, you know, as you know, academics write a lot. They're always doing uh, research and writing. And everything that they write, they try to publish. And everything they publish has to be in English. Almost all of the journals that they're interested in are English. And they all start there. They become, uh, you know, something else later on. But they start. And now their English is good. And their, their conversation in English is good, but when it comes to writing, they need a little help with syntax and punctuation and things like that. So I'm their editor. <laughs> and so, so they write all these papers, they send them to me, I go through them, edit them, send them back. The quid pro quo is they say, come on over for the summer. Well, how can you say no to that? <laughs> well, you know. I've been doing that. 
And now in, with this whole uh, pandemic thing, of course, they're doing the same thing we're doing and they're, they're working with their students virtually. They're still involved at the university, both of them. The, the husband is now the dean of the program and his wife is a, uh, is, is a full professor, but they're working with their students mostly virtually. So a couple of times they've asked me to get, come on board just as we're doing here with Zoom and lecture on particular subjects that are of interest uh, to them that we are you know, concerned about here in the United States. I spent two hours the other day talking about ethics, for instance, you know, there, there's one that'll put you to sleep, but, uh, <laughs> but they were interested and uh, so that, that's how I get to do that. Well, that's wonderful. And you show, you embody the spirit of Hopkinton in a way, uh, how we are a global town for one day with the Boston Marathon. We reach out to uh, countries, places all over the world, and they come here for one day. And you go out there and you are, it sounds like you've been a bit of a friend to people in 30 different countries and, and you get opportunities like this. That's wonderful. And um, so well, how I, fortunate. As a matter of fact, I gotta tell you that, you know, we, we developed a relationship with the town of Marathon, Greece. That's several right. years ago and yeah. they, they were basically we were sister cities that's right yeah and, uh -huh. uh, i was because i was going back and forth with my friends i said okay i'll i'll jump in there and i i went to marathon a couple times and met with them and it was a wonderful relationship we had wonderful and yeah. you speak a little uh greek no, no. I, I, okay. I can say hello goodbye and please and thank you and excuse me and things like that but all right I never tried to be conversation i'll tell you a story my wife and I hosted uh, foreign students for many, many years, and they, they came to us through an association, a, a school up in Vermont, where young people would come to America mm -hmm. to learn English. And they went to the school in Vermont. At the end of their time there, they would spend a couple of weeks with an uh, uh, American family. We did that for many years. And we had Italian students, we had Swiss students, we had Chinese students, we had, you know, wonderful experience. And every time I discovered that I was treating them like I was talking to them, I was talking down to them, not deliberately, but because their English was not very good, they were still learning English. And I was treating them almost like children. And I said, this is terrible, this is awful. And I said, I'm not gonna put, my, I'm not gonna put myself in that position. I'm not gonna go to Greece and pretend that I'm learning their language, absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. So I never did. But however, everybody, you know, so many people over there speak good English that it's not a problem. Bob, um, we only have four minutes left. Can you believe that? Um, I want to talk about your book. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that it makes sense. One of the things you've got involved in as a volunteer is uh, dispute resolution, which basically means you've been helping people communicate uh, and resolve disputes. Uh, and um, I think that uh, I hope that you do a whole uh, show uh, uh, so we can learn more on that. And <laughs> since we only have four minutes left, I, I would like you to talk a little bit about your love of writing um, and your book, Michael's Eyes. Um, yeah, hello, okay. uh, whatever you want to tell about the book. Well, you know, I'm a civil engineer and engineers are not especially good writers and not many engineers get involved in, in writing for popular uh, publication. I did a lot of writing technical writing for journals and that sort of thing. <clears throat> but I got involved with Michael Zayas kind of by a mistake. I, I heard a sermon one Sunday about the blind man reported in the John's Gospel. I think it's the ninth chapter. And the blind man suddenly was given his sight. And this was a man who was born blind. And somebody came along and this, this blind man was a beggar with his little tin cup sitting by the road. And that was the only way he could make a living. And somebody came along, it did something. And suddenly the man had his sight. And of course the gospels talk about that and you know how marvelous that was, of course. And then I noticed that there were struggles as a result of him getting his sight. Uh, the hierarchy of the synagogue, they, they didn't want to hear about this miracle man who was doing miracles in their country. And they, they suppressed him, and as you, as you read in the Gospels, they uh, interviewed him, and they really put him through the ring and tried to get him to deny the fact that, you know, he was even blind in the first place, or maybe they didn't give him his sight. 
it occurred to me that that's very strange. How would a guy now, whether you take that as just pure legend or whether you take it as quote gospel, right. it's a very interesting. How would a man in that position then make a living at the so age of- So you pursued the question. And that's, so that's what I went into. And I, I, I started it as a sort of a mental exercise to try to figure out maybe how could he have lived his life? And it, I kept writing and writing and writing. And pretty soon somebody said, hey, why don't you publish that? It's kind of interesting. So, yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. And now it's out there on Amazon. Yeah, it's, it's available. Sure. I haven't. And you're working on another one. I, I have another one at a, at a publisher's now. Yes. Yeah. So you're keeping pretty busy and we'll have to stay tuned to learn more about that. And uh, it sounds like something interesting is always going on, even during this time of global pandemic. Um, we have to s uh, stop for now. Um, is there one last line sentence you'd like to end us with of advice, philosophy, wisdom? Sure. My, my oldest son says, the reason you are relatively spry at the age of 88 is because you stay connected. And it's being connected that keeps you, your, your brain working and your, your body moving. And, and, and that's what I tell people. Don't think that retirement is, you're gonna just go fishing every day or play golf. You've got to find something to do in your retirement. I've been retired for several decades now and you know, a couple of decades anyway although I was doing a lot of consulting during my retirement. And uh, that was one of the things that kept me busy, that along with FIG. And then I started writing. The point I love is, that advice. You've got to have something to wake you up in the morning and get you started. Well, thank you so much. I love that advice for us all, where we are right now. Stay connected, get connected, absolutely, absolutely. even when we're on Zoom. <laughs> okay, good, yes. Thank you so much, Bob, for your time, your interview today. It was wonderful and inspiring, and I wish you good days going forward. Thank you, Cheryl, very much. I enjoyed it, and it's an honor. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Bye.